So our next speaker is Alex Adrian Ogar, Solutions Architect at CPOs. He'll be talking to us about serverless powered low code. Hello. Hey, welcome Alex Adrian. Thank you. So should I share my screen? Yes. That's it. Can you see? Yes, I can see the screen. Yep. All right. Well, hello, okay. everyone. I'll step back. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this presentation. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is how to build serverless powered low code applications. And before explaining to you what is hidden behind this attractive title, I'd like to make a bulk assessment. In 2021, I feel they, there are two sides in the tech environment. There is the coders side. Um, one of the big challenges for them is to improve developer experience. The DevX is all about seeing APIs and tech products as actual real products. The intention behind this is to design APIs as you design end user products. You should take care that your product is understood and easy to use, fast to implement, and it's especially, especially light. And because in the end, if some businesses want to implement your service and they ask their developers what they think about your API, you might be difficult to defend if your product is hard to implement. And on the other side, there are the low coders. They intend to develop as fast as they can, and they hide the complexity of code with GUI tools. They do not actually intend to, to believe that DevX is useless, of course, but they prefer to develop as fast as they can. They even developed tools that are made to build and deploy product faster. Low coders can also be people with uh, no computer science knowledge, which is good. I believe that more people should be able to build tech products. But as low code platform kind of are targeting um, non-tech people, it might feel for coders that the, the, they don't care about DevX. For those who don't know, uh, the low code trend refers to a set of tools that are software development platforms. They tend to, to accelerate the app delivery by dramatically reducing the amount of hand coding that is required. A few low code leaders are Mendix, OutSystems, Salesforce, and Appian. But you can also find small tools that are currently skyrocketing, such as Bobble, Stacker, or, or AppSheets. You also might have seen that the low-code expression is often linked to the no-code expression. As I've tried to search for the difference on the, on the internet, the only thing I understood was that nobody agreed on the difference. But let me give you my definition of the, the difference between low-code and no-code. Well, they're both platforms intended to help you to deliver tech products faster. But in the no-code one, it's impossible for you to inject any sort of code while it's possible in the low-code one. For example, in Mendix, you can write custom functions yourself using Java. But so it's, it's a low-code platform. Now that you know kind of low-code, let me tell you why I'm going to talk about this today. My name is Alex Adrian. I work at CPOs. And uh, at CPOs, we're fixing banking by creating custom applications and by using, well, APIs. At CPOs, I'm a solutions architect. I figure out the best tech solution when a client first comes to us with a problem. And I'm often put between two worlds, the, the developer world and the business world. Developers want to design state-of-the-art architecture and write great codes while business people want speed because the world is moving and they need to go fast. So I had to find new ways to go faster while still keeping the, the interest of developers. When I dealt with the subject of local tools, I found one major issue. The issue being that real apps have APIs. For example, the actual open banking world is all about APIs. We have let people build products around banking services. We let them build interfaces, but the data that is inside is all provided by banking APIs that are integrated. The, the whole application without the banking API is worth nothing. Even if they try to let you manipulate their own data in their app, it would be useless because not connected to your bank. Let's take an example. You can see a, a screenshot on the right part of the slide. This is the BBVA app. It's a Spanish bank. When you use it, you'll find features about banking. Well, all of this is only possible because they have rich APIs. 
You can even find the details of the APIs they're using on, the de on their developer portal, as you can see on the other screenshots. And as of today, I don't think you could reasonably develop all this using local tools, which is good news because it means we need both worlds. Which leads me to think that APIs means code. And I couldn't say that services do not already communicate with local, with local products. Actually, a lot of big worldwide services provide APIs that are already integrated in local environment. We could mention services such as Intercom, Google Maps, but also payment solutions such as Stripe, which is already integrated in Bubble, for example. But I guess you often need some particular APIs, which means you have to write code. Because custom code is the only way for a local platform to connect to particular APIs. When you build a product with a local development platform that is communicating with one of your internal services, you might want to consider to actually write code to connect systems. And I believe there is two interfaces to a local platform. There is on one side, the catalog of already connected service that you can use as you go. And there is the other interface, a more tech one, uh, one that, is, that you connect to with code. And guess what? I think we're all here for the same thing. If you need code, you'll have to think about DevEx. You'll have to provide a stable, a robust, clear, and easy to maintain code base. Here's an example of how poor a developer experience can be. It's the Mendix developer environment a few years ago. Of course, they've improved since. But presenting this to a developer might discourage him or her. If you want to convince yourself, go and ask a few developers to let you observe them during work. You'll find that a few are using a lot of shortcuts. Uh, they're not all using the same development environment. And all this is possible because in the end, they are writing code and not using a single software. Some of them will want to do everything in a terminal. Others are using point and click functionalities. And they all can be as productive. They, they actually choose how they want to be. And as local platforms choose and prioritize what features they develop, the software they provide cannot suit everyone, which is normal. But hence the feel that DevEx is not at the center of it. So let's go deeper in the understanding of how to build real apps while still leveraging the building speed of Loco. To be perfectly candid, I did not find some sort of magical wand that allows me to transform any piece of local platform to a perfect developer environment. But I think I found a way to separate things so that when writing code, developers should be happy and still get to reduce the amount of hand coding that is required, because that's what low code is all about. The first principle to keep in mind is that APIs are tough to plug into product as they are not uniform. Whenever you build an app that is relying on data, the APIs you're using are actually not directly designed to fit in your app. So you have to find a way so that developers do not lose their mind. For example, if you design an app relying on a SOAP API, a REST one, some GraphQL, and a flat file downloaded from the web, everything will not arrange itself magically. And especially if you connect each API from the low-code point of view, you'll find yourself dealing with the complexity of connecting to those APIs, dealing with various formats, and the difficulty will actually grow with the number and diversity of the APIs you connect. On the right part of the slide, you can find a sequence diagram related to a feature that posts an order for a bank transaction. If there are three steps to perform that, you have to connect everything from your app. But actually, your local app should not be related for, to, to some transaction report or permission system. It should actually only be linked to what you want to do, post an order for a bank transaction. Fortunately, there are solutions out there. If you need to fade the complexity of where you're taking your data, the facade design pattern is there for you. You can completely hide the complexity of your data source in a single API that is easy to implement. The idea here is to connect an API that is built for your app and your use case. To do that, I found three easy steps to successfully design and implement the facade. Step one, define your need. Try to summarize what you want to perform. In the less techy way, focus on, on the, the business need. Step two, identify and develop first level connectors. What I mean here is develop functions that will only perform API calls using the API standard and their way of thinking. And step three, connect everything. 
that step might look like a magical one, but trust me, once you've defined what you want and that you have functions that perform API calls, everything should become clearer. Let's take a look at how easy it could be if everything was in the right place. We'll be able to make a single API call from the application that is placing the order of a bank transaction, as I explained earlier. And from the local perspective, it's one API call. From the developer perspective, it's plain old classic code. Everything is as usual. You'll find on the right side of the slide some code snippets showing how simple the first function should be. And even if you never coded anything, you could read the code and understand what it does. It's all about simplicity. Let's move on to the second principle. The second principle to have in mind is that APIs are just like humans. They are unpredictable. Here you'll find a timeline of health checks of an API you use in your app. Every time one API is down, the whole application is broken, and that's really unfortunate. Imagine being a developer trying to test some features in that. Might be a nightmare of not even being able to test a piece of code because one API is unavailable. There, the solution is to design the connection of your APIs in a defensive way. Defensive design is the tech practice of anticipating every possible outcome of a system. Here are loved APIs. It means that you should handle every possible response of any API you're using. I've mentioned in that part four ways for you to implement design patterns related to defensive design. The first one is data validation. Even if the specification of an API say that you should receive only strings, doesn't mean they can't have bugs and send you integers. Now, how would your app react to an integer in place of a string? Well, the only way to know is to implement it. Uh, so this is called data validation. The second one is the retry pattern. Uh, there, the idea is not to stop when, when, it, when one API is not responding the expected answer, but to define a certain number of attempts you want to try before aborting. The principle is simple. Try to connect. If it fails, look at how many times you've tried. You, if you can try again, do it. If not, abort. The third one is the dead letter queue. Defect can happen. The philosophy of this pattern is to put, to put aside errors and let them wait until we can find a solution for it. You should store somewhere information about bugs and analyze all of them. And sometimes even you can perform custom actions to put back the system where it should be. And the fourth one is the circuit breaker. To summarize, there is three states in which your app can be. The first state is when everything is normal and working smoothly. The second state is when something occurred in your code. That state is when it's broken. And the third state is when a service you use is in its own broken state. What you should do when that happens is to break the circuit and fail fast and present something different to your end users. Those patterns are all about preventing your app to be in a, an embarrassing position. So now let's assume that whenever you want to build a real life app, you'll need code. But it's 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 not always just code, right? It's it's not about it's not about the developer writing blazingly fast line of code in his computer. About delivery, local platform always provide a, a way to deploy the app. That means that you'll always have a, a deploy button that will magically make your work available on the World Wide Web. With code, you need a bunch of other things. For example, when you write some API, you, you can just let it stay on your computer. You should deploy it, so you need cloud infrastructure. When something is in the production environment, you'll, you'll want to make sure that every new line of code has a second look before going to production. That's code review. And whenever you want to make sure that you're not breaking previously coded features, you'll write tests. All of this comes with writing code. And since we talk about building products with local platform that actually do not always provide a testing suit, You'll have to find one for your code. Here comes serverless. Serverless is actually a good answer to deploy APIs used by local platforms as it solves the infrastructure and deployment problems behind classic code. So I guess you understand where I'm going. Serverless is a way for developers to build powerful APIs while having a good developer experience, which allows people to build products with local development platforms to consume data from other services. For those who don't know, um, serverless is a framework that allows developers to write functions and deploy them as functions in the cloud without having to deal with server or any, some sort of, any sort of cloud resource. 
For example, when you deploy your serverless project in uh, AWS, the AWS cloud, you'll find that it creates an S3 bucket to store the code base. Then it creates a Lambda function in your AWS. Lambda is the AWS product to deploy pieces of code without dealing with server. But serverless also helps you to set up a database such as DynamoDB, which is the NoSQL database of AWS. And then to expose your code in the real world, serverless can register your code in an API gateway so that you can trigger your code with an HTTPS API. Or you could schedule the execution of your code on a daily basis with the CloudWatch events. So now let's try to mix everything up. How do we arrange serverless with a local platform? Well, first, let's look at some diagrams so that we understand how it worked. As I said earlier, local platforms comes with their own way of deploying. So we can see this platform as some sort of black box. The last difficult thing to do is to find the correct place and trigger for your serverless API in, lo in your local app. I found three convenient places to integrate an API in a local app. The first place is to embed your API in an HTTPS link. And then you can find a way to let it be available to the end user. You can do that generally by making the URL be an attribute for, to a model. And in a specific view of your app, the local environment will let you display the link. The two other places are not directly exposed to the end user, but more plugged into the backend. You can, for example, trigger your API with uh, when some data manipulation happens. For example, in, in Airtable, you can trigger a script that can call your API when a line is created or when a record match a certain condition. That is convenient for you to make sure you perform your actions at the right time. And last but not least, the third place to put your API is behind a time schedule. You can easily create some sort of cron job using serverless features. You can register your function to run every minute or every hour or any time. And this way of integrating new features is particularly useful when you want to enhance your data with other data coming from APIs. To conclude, um, let's look at an example. If we take again the use case of posting an order for a bank transfer, I can embed a link to confirm the order creation with the, the bank in a specific view of my local app. And that link will contain a random string uh, generated by the local app so that each time an end user click on the link, it's actually a personalized link just for this end user. That link will trigger an API registered behind the API gateway AWS. And the code displayed on the, so on the side, on the, the right part will be executed. You can find here that the function that is executed is only about calling other functions. That is the facade. The complexity is hidden in smaller functions, providing smaller technical features. Now look at one, one smaller function. Let's take the example of fetching some files stored somewhere on the web. As I know that this server might sometimes miss requests because of technical difficulty, I implemented the retry button to make sure to try at least three times before I bought it. And as you can see, I showed on the, on, the, on the right side, a YAML file containing how my function will be deployed. That function will be deployed behind an API gateway in my AWS account. You can see the details of what I want serverless to deploy on the file there. So that was an example, but in the end, the most important is the method you use. Well, that's the end. Um, thank you for your attention. I, uh, I hope you learned something. My message is that local platforms are great products and real apps still need custom APIs that you need to connect to with code. And serverless is one way, one method to make local even, even more powerful and keep a great DevEx for our products. And uh, now I believe that it's the time for some question and answers, if I'm right. Hey, Alex Adrian. Yes, uh, but we have indeed received the questions from the audience. There's a comment from Phil Nash. No code is too restrictive. No code is too restrictive. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess the no code environment is is all about avoiding custom code injection so that the app work as the, the designer intended it to work. 
So I guess if you think no code is too restrictive, maybe you, you just don't have a use case to use it. But if you take an entrepreneur wanting to, to, to make a proof of concept of an app, the, the, the no code solution is actually a good fit for it. OK. Uh, OK, there are uh, questions flowing in. So Alan from API Bull, the next speaker, uh, his question is, is low code just a fad, or will it be around in 10 years? Well, it's kind of early to say, because low code is still some, some sort of tech trend, and you, you can't see uh, low code or no code applications everywhere right now. Um, if, if, if you take a look at some theory about computer science, about informatics, you'll see that the, the low-code principle is like, uh, is like in the fourth generation of code. So it's actually just an evolution of code, and an evolution in the sense that you, you just take a new level of abstraction. So the theory is saying that we're heading to that, but maybe we'll find a new ways to, um, to, be, to, be new, to have a new level of abstraction, but um, the theory say we, hey, we, we're heading to that direction, but the future, I don't. I don't know what the future is all about. OK. So the next question is, uh, what is the difference between retry and circuit breaker? Mm. Um, well, the difference is you can actually combine those. The, the difference is the retry pattern is, is about trying like three or four times to, to call an API because you know that for some reason, uh, the API might respond to the second or the third call when you, you call it. While the circuit breaker is all about saying, okay, I detected that one of my APIs is not responding and I don't know when that API will be available again. So what I do is I cut the circuit. So I, I, make, I make my application not use that API for all my users until the API is up again. So the idea of the retry is to uh, well, retry calling an API uh, again and again and again, while the circuit breaker is to protect your users when you detected that there, there are some defects. Okay. And the last one, how does the low code can benefit the developer teams, especially in enterprise environment? Well, that's a real interesting question. For entrepreneurs, the low code is all about going fast. And for the, for the larger companies, I found that um, you can actually empower um, internal developers that want to create tools for them or even put produ uh, production uh, production ready application out there. But the idea for large company is to um, let non-tech people be able to build tech products. So you can use um, a mid-cat company uh, low-code app such as Mendix or Art Systems. You can buy a license. Um, and uh, use this app and combine this software with a team of developers that are um, dedicated to write custom custom API integration. Um, so basically, you have two sides. You have, you have one low-code platform that you subscribe to, and you dedicate one team um, of your company to develop connectors for that local environment, so that whenever you need something, you can you can provide a way for non-tech people to build products using your internal APIs because you have dedicated a team to develop the the custom connections it needs. But that's that's a great subject, and actually the um, the way to make it is quite complex, and I, I would love to discuss it more because it there is so much to say. So if if, if you need anything, just uh, just send me an email or anything because that's a real complex subject. Great. Yeah, great.